Andersonville National Historic Site, Wikipedia Article Audio The Andersonville National Historic Site, located near Andersonville, Georgia, preserves the former Camp Sumter, a Confederate prisoner of war camp during the final 12 months of the American Civil War. Most of the site lies in southwestern Macon County, adjacent to the east side of the town of Andersonville. As well as the former prison, the site contains the Andersonville National Cemetery and the National Prisoner of War Museum. The site is an iconic reminder of the horrors of Civil War prisons. It was commanded by Captain Henry Wurz, who was tried and executed after the war for war crimes. It was overcrowded to four times its capacity, with an inadequate water supply, inadequate food rations, and unsanitary conditions. Of the approximately 45,000 Union prisoners held at Camp Sumter during the war, nearly 13,000 died. The chief causes of death were scurvy, diarrhea, and dysentery. Conditions Descriptions of Andersonville The prison, which opened in February 1864, originally covered about 16.5 acres of land enclosed by a 15-foot-high stockade. In June 1864, it was enlarged to 26.5 acres. The stockade was rectangular, of dimensions 1,620 feet by 779 feet. There were two entrances on the west side of the stockade, known as North Entrance and South Entrance. Robert H. Kellogg, Sergeant Major in the 16th Regiment Connecticut Volunteers, described his entry as a prisoner into the prison camp, May 2, 1864. As we entered the place, a spectacle met our eyes that almost froze our blood with horror, and made our hearts fail within us. Before us were forms that had once been active and erect, stalwart men, now nothing but mere walking skeletons, covered with filth and vermin. Many of our men, in the heat and intensity of their feeling, exclaimed with earnestness, Can this be hell? God protect us! And all thought that he alone could bring them out alive from so terrible a place. In the center of the hole was a swamp, occupying about three or four acres of the narrowed limits, and a part of this marshy place had been used by the prisoners as a sink, and excrement covered the ground, the scent arising from which was suffocating. The ground allotted to our ninety was near the edge of this plague spot, and how we were to live through the warm summer weather in the midst of such fearful surroundings, was more than we cared to think of just then. Further descriptions of the camp can be found in the diary of Ransom Chadwick, a member of the 85th New York Infantry Regiment. Chadwick and his regimental mates were taken to the Andersonville Prison, arriving on April 30, 1864. An extensive and detailed diary was kept by John L. Ransom of his time as a prisoner at Andersonville. Father Peter Wellen arrived on June 16, 1864 to muster the resources of the church and help provide relief to the prisoners. The Deadline at Andersonville, a light fence known as the Dead Line was erected approximately 19 feet inside the stockade wall. It demarcated a no-man's land that kept prisoners away from the stockade wall, which was made of rough-hewn logs about 16 feet high and stakes driven into the ground. Anyone crossing or even touching this Dead Line was shot without warning by sentries in the pigeon roosts. At this time in the war, Andersonville Prison was frequently undersupplied with food. The Confederate Army and civilians also struggled to get enough food. The shortage was suffered by prisoners and the Confederate personnel alike within the fort, but the prisoners received less than the guards, 
as the latter did not suffer such emaciation, nor scurvy. The latter was probably the main cause of mortality. Even when sufficient quantities of supplies were available, they were of poor quality and poorly prepared. Health Problems There were no new clothes given to prisoners whose clothing was often falling to pieces. In some cases, clothes were taken from the dead. John McElroy, a prisoner at Andersonville, recalls before one was fairly cold his clothes would be appropriated and divided, and I have seen many sharp fights between contesting claimants. Although the prison was surrounded by forest, very little wood was allowed to the prisoners for warmth or cooking. This and the lack of utensils made it almost impossible for the prisoners to cook the main food they received, poorly milled corn flour. During the summer of 1864, Union prisoners suffered greatly from hunger, exposure, and disease. Within seven months, about a third died from what was diagnosed as dysentery and scurvy, they were buried in mass graves, the standard practice by Confederate prison authorities at Andersonville. In 1864 the Confederate Surgeon General asked Joseph Jones, an expert on infectious disease, to investigate the high mortality rate at the camp. He concluded that it was due to scorbutic dysentery. In 2010 the historian Drisdell said that hookworm disease, a condition not recognized or known during the Civil War, was the major cause of much of the mortality. The water supply from Stockade Creek became polluted when too many Union prisoners were housed by the Confederate authorities within the prison walls. Part of the creek was used as a sink, and the men were forced to wash themselves in the creek. Survival and Social Networks At the time of the Civil War, the concept of a prisoner of war camp was still new. It was as late as 1863 when President Lincoln demanded a code of conduct be instituted to guarantee prisoners of war the entitlement to food and medical treatment and to protect them from enslavement, torture, and murder. Andersonville did not provide its occupants with these guarantees, therefore, the prisoners at Andersonville, without any sort of law enforcement or protections, functioned more closely to a primitive society than a civil one. As such, survival often depended on the strength of a prisoner's social network within the prison. A prisoner with friends inside Andersonville was more likely to survive than a lonesome prisoner. Social networks provided prisoners with food, clothes, shelter, moral support, trading opportunities, and protection against other prisoners. One study found that a prisoner having a strong social network within Andersonville had a statistically significant positive effect on survival probabilities, and that the closer the ties between friends as measured by such identifiers as ethnicity, kinship, and the same hometown, the bigger the effect. The Raiders The guards, disease, starvation, and exposure were not all that prisoners had to deal with. A group of prisoners, calling themselves the Andersonville Raiders, attacked their fellow inmates to steal food, jewelry, money, and clothing. They were armed mostly with clubs and killed to get what they wanted. Another group rose up organized by Peter Big Pete Aubrey, to stop the larceny, calling themselves regulators. They caught nearly all of the raiders, who were tried by the regulators' judge, Peter McCullough, and jury, selected from a group of new prisoners. This jury, upon finding the raiders guilty, set punishment that included running the gauntlet, being sent to the stocks, ball, and chain and, in six cases, hanging. Confederacies offer to release prisoners. The conditions were so poor that in July 1864, 
Captain Wurz paroled five Union soldiers to deliver a petition signed by the majority of Andersonville's prisoners asking that the Union reinstate prisoner exchanges in order to relieve the overcrowding and allow prisoners to leave these terrible conditions. That request was denied. The Union soldiers, who had sworn to do so, returned to report this to their comrades. In the latter part of the summer of 1864, the Confederacy offered to conditionally release prisoners if the Union would send ships to retrieve them. In the autumn of 1864, after the capture of Atlanta, all the prisoners who were well enough to be moved were sent to Millen, Georgia, and Florence, South Carolina. At Millen, better arrangements prevailed. After General William Tecumseh Sherman began his march to the sea, the prisoners were returned to Andersonville. Prisoner Population During the war, 45,000 prisoners were received at Andersonville Prison, of these nearly 13,000 died. The nature and causes of the deaths are a continuing source of controversy among historians. Some contend that the deaths resulted from deliberate Confederate war crimes against Union prisoners, while others state that they resulted from disease promoted by severe overcrowding, the food shortage in the Confederate states, the prison officials' incompetence, and the breakdown of the prisoner exchange system caused by the Confederacy's refusal to include blacks in the exchanges, thus overfilling the stockade. During the war, disease was the primary cause of death in both armies, suggesting that infectious disease was a chronic problem, due to poor sanitation in regular as well as prison camps. 7160, April 1, 1864 12, 000, May 5, 1864, 20, 652, June 13, 1864, 23, 942, June 19, 1864, 29, 076, July 18, 1864, 31, 678, July 31st. 1864, 31,693, August 31, 1864. A young Union prisoner, Dorrance Atwater, was chosen to record the names and numbers of the dead at Andersonville, for the use by the Confederacy and the federal government after the war ended. He believed, correctly, the federal government would never see the list. Therefore, he sat next to Henry Wurz, who was in charge of the prison pen, and secretly kept his own list among other papers. When Atwater was released, he put the list in his bag and took it through the lines without being caught. It was published by the New York Tribune when Horace Greeley, the paper's owner, learned the federal government had refused the list and given Atwater much grief. It was Atwater's opinion that Andersonville's commanding officer was trying to ensure that Union prisoners would be rendered unfit to fight if they survived. POW Newell Birch also recorded Andersonville's decrepit conditions. A member of the 154th New York Volunteer Infantry, Birch was captured on the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg. He was first imprisoned at Belle Isle in Richmond, Virginia, and then Andersonville. He is credited with being the longest-held Union prisoner of war during the Civil War, surviving a total of 661 days in Confederate hands. His original diary is in the collection of the Dunn County Historical Society in Menominee, Wisconsin, a mimeographed copy is held by the Wisconsin Historical Society. Confederate records show that 351 prisoners escaped, though many were recaptured. The U.S. Army lists 32 as returning to Union lines, 
of the rest, some likely simply returned to civilian life without notifying the military, while others probably died. Torrance Atwater Andersonville Prison was liberated in May 1865. Newell Birch After the war, Henry Wurz, commandant of the inner stockade at Camp Sumter, was tried by a military tribunal on charges of war crimes. The trial was presided over by Union General Lew Wallace and featured Chief Judge Advocate General Prosecutor Norton Parker Chipman. A number of former prisoners testified about conditions at Andersonville, many accusing Wurz of specific acts of cruelty, for some of which Wurz was not even present in the camp. The court also considered official correspondence from captured Confederate records. Perhaps the most damaging was a letter to the Confederate Surgeon General by Dr. James Jones, who in 1864 was sent by Richmond to investigate conditions at Camp Sumter. Jones had been appalled by what he found, and reported he vomited twice and contracted influenza from the single hour he'd toured the camp. His graphically detailed report to his superiors all but closed the case for the prosecution. Wurz presented evidence that he had pleaded to Confederate authorities to try to get more food and that he had tried to improve the conditions for the prisoners inside. However, he was found guilty and was sentenced to death, and on November 10, 1865, he was hanged. Wurz was the only Confederate official to be tried and convicted of war crimes resulting from the Civil War. The revelation of the prisoners' sufferings was one of the factors that shaped public opinion in the North regarding the South after the close of the Civil War. In 1890, the Grand Army of the Republic, Department of Georgia, bought the site of Andersonville Prison through membership and subscriptions. In 1910, the site was donated to the federal government by the Women's Relief Corps. Escapes Liberation Trial Aftermath the National Prisoner of War Museum opened in 1998 as a memorial to all American prisoners of war. Exhibits use art, photographs, displays, and video presentations to depict the capture, living conditions, hardships, and experiences of American prisoners of war in all periods. The museum also serves as the park's visitor center. The cemetery is the final resting place for the Union prisoners who died while being held at Camp Sumter slash Andersonville as POWs. The prisoners' burial ground at Camp Sumter has been made a national cemetery. It contains 13,714 graves, of which 921 are marked unknown. As a national cemetery, it is also used as a burial place for more recent veterans and their dependents. Visitors can walk the 26.5-acre site of Camp Sumter, which has been outlined with double rows of white posts. Two sections of the stockade wall have been reconstructed, the north gate and the northeast corner. Some of the monuments at Andersonville Bird's Eye View Memorial Wall National Prisoner of War Museum Statue Providence Spring Providence Spring Andersonville National Cemetery Notable Monuments and Burials Depictions in Popular Culture Star Fort Panoramic View of Site Detail of Graves Memorial Rostrum Gallery Rostrum Interior Andersonville National Cemetery II Scholarly Studies Primary and Other Sources